Hey, this is Abraham. Welcome to another episode of the Governance Channel, where we teach you the language of government contracting. In today's episode, we have our guest, Ms. Lisa White, where she shares with us about how she was working as a salesperson for an office furniture dealer. She gave them a business proposal, and they set up a, helped her set up a business for herself. And now she's growing a business in the commercial market and in the government market. Stay tuned. I'll see you on the inside to learn more about her story. Well, hey, it's another, it's time again for another episode of Governese, where we teach you how to speak the language of government contracting. It's awesome to uh, be here with you, Crystal. How are you doing, Crystal? It's been a minute. I'm doing good. I know. I'm doing great. Doing great. Glad to be back on the scene. That's right. Well, hey, you know, I think uh, the, the world is uh, always evolving, especially with the pandemic and with challenges in Europe. And, and yes. you know, uh, it's always evolving. And so, but as entrepreneurs, you know, this is time where we also evolve, right? We, we got a, a change and ebb and flow with the market conditions, uh, opportunities that comes along the way. Uh, and so today we've got a special uh, guest here. You want to introduce our guest? And, and, and because she's evolved along the way also in terms of her career and her business, so. Yes, yes, I'm super excited uh, about our guest today. Um, today we have Miss Lisa White. Um, Lisa is the principal of White Howard Brands. She has over 20 plus years of experience in the furniture industry. Um, she's very knowledgeable of industry practices, including market trends and environmental concerns. Uh, with the products of Kimball Office, Lisa has served a vast client base, um, which includes Fortune 100 and 500 companies, uh, the federal government, medical institutions, and colleges and universities. Uh, Lisa's background includes sales and marketing uh, within corporate and federal se federal sectors. Uh, she hosts educational events for upcoming for professionals, as well as training and motivational activities with clients. Uh, Lisa is the first woman and minority owned Kimball Select dealer in the state of Georgia. Um, her specialties include sales and marketing, uh, again, with the federal, state, and, and county agencies, and client relations and nego negotiations. So I'd like to introduce our special guest, Miss Lisa White. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Abe, you want to jump us off? Or, um, well, how about this, Lisa? You just tell us um, a little bit how about how you got started. Uh, in your industry and just talk to us a little bit about our industry, your industry. And as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, you know, I, I just was blind to the, the furniture industry, the, the dealer, uh, the role that you play in the industry. So before I met you, I, I, I didn't have a clue. So I'm sure there are a lot of people that are going to be watching this that probably don't have a clue about how this works. So yeah, tell us about how you how you got started about your business and a little bit about, you know, your role in this in this whole furniture, commercial furniture industry. Absolutely. So first and foremost, I didn't know anything about it either. It actually landed in my lap. Mm -hmm. We relocated from, I'm originally from New York. And when my father was looking to retire in the late 80s, um, my mom came to me and was like, hey, we're going to be moving to Atlanta, and I am the youngest of five, mm -hmm. and freshly out of college, my mom was like, and you're coming with us, and after I rolled my eyes several times, I was like, okay, I guess I am, since she's um, proposed that she can't, that, that they were not in bo on board with me staying in New York mm -hmm. on my own um, without a job, and I had not gotten a job yet moved here to Atlanta and actually took a temp position with a commercial furniture dealership. Mm -hmm. And for those that might listen in that um, have been familiar with the furniture industry, the name of that dealer was Ball Stocker. And Ball Stocker was a um, large commercial furniture dealership that back then it was okay for you to have competing brands under what they call one umbrella or through one distributorship. Mm 
-hmm. And they had both Kimball and Herman Miller products that they worked with, or mm -hmm. that was their two primary brands. Most dealers represent over about 200 plus manufacturers to kind of round out their portfolio. Mm -hmm. I worked temp for them for about three months and then HR came to me and said, hey, how would you like to take this on as a permanent position? And I was like, you know, sure, why not? Fresh out of college and I wanna say my starting salary guys was like 28,000. Yeah, that, that was not, a lot. Not, I not think quite I was looking for twenty-five not, when I graduated. I girl, like, exactly. Not quite thir not <laughs> quite thirty thousand dollars. And I thought I had hit the jackpot. I was yeah. like, yay! Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like this is perfect for me. Um and in that role that I was doing for them, I was um a sales assistant. So we checked all of the orders for our salespeople to make sure that everything was accurate. We entered the orders for them. We did a lot of behind the scenes work when it comes to getting the product out to the particular client. I went from that to working, going directly to working for Kimball as a manufacturer's rep, which was almost heaven. Um, it allowed me to be able to go out into the marketplace to meet a lot of different people. And I started that um, June of 94, actually, is when I started my career with Kimball. And I stayed with them for 23 years. Wow. And after matriculating from Kimball, went into business ownership for myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to leave out this little part. It was prophesied to me that I would own my own business um, about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fully even understand or take on the prophecy. Mm -hmm. But two years after that prophecy, I met a woman that looked like me that owned her own commercial furniture dealership out of Ohio. Okay. And I had never met anyone that actually owned the distributorship that looked like me male or female. Mm -hmm. It is a heavily white dominated male mm -hmm. um, career path to mm -hmm. be in ownership of a dealership. Mm -hmm. And I started speaking with her and asking her a lot of different questions about, you know, how did she do this? How did she get into the industry? All sorts of things. And she actually started her career on the interior design side. Okay. And I didn't go to school for interior design. I actually went to school for computer science okay. and never worked within my career right. path. Uh -huh. Uh, went to Kimball with a business plan because knowing that they were looking to open up what they called a select dealership here in Atlanta. They mm -hmm. wanted to develop that model here in Atlanta. It had been very successful for them in other parts of the country. And I was like, hey, would you be interested in me kind of kicking that off and being that dealer for you? And lo and behold, they said yes. And I was like, wow, this actually might actually happen. Mm -hmm. And it did. We birthed White Howard Brands Commercial Interiors July 1st of 2017. Awesome. awesome. That's awesome. You know, in terms of your journey uh, from even from transitioning from New York to Georgia, it takes a lot of courage for your parents to, mm -hmm. to uproot and move to a whole new place. Right. Uh, and it, then you probably got a lot of friends, lots of connections back in New York. And, you know, you probably didn't want to move. Uh, so I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia, Atlanta, nothing was happening really down here. Well, I mean, not much. Things were just starting to jump off probably when you They got were here. just starting to jump off. Um, development was really starting to kick high into gear. And then when you reach, say, 96, and we got the Olympics mm -hmm. in 96, mm -hmm. that really kind of just catapulted Atlanta into yeah. a whole different mm -hmm. atmosphere. So it was a lot of exciting things happening. Um, you also had the bigger boom of maybe the second phase of Motown, because mm -hmm. you had a lot of r and artists that were growing up here out of Atlanta as well. And yeah. then they were opening up their own studios and such. I can remember... Um, Kenny Babyface Edmonds uh -huh. and oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember his partner's name. Um, L.A. Reed. Thank you, L.A. Reed. They came into Face. Ball Stalker mm -hmm. one day, and uh, the showroom manager ran back to my desk and was like, "We want you to come up front and actually walk them through the showroom." And I was thinking to myself, "Yeah, because I'm the only right uh, person yeah. here, but <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll roll with it." <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me, I'll roll with it. Yeah. And I walked them through the showroom and we actually furnished some of their studio with a couple of the pieces oh, 
that uh, Ball Stopper sold back then. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just met the young lady who um, used to be uh, do A and R with LaFace. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I was out having dinner with one of my friends, and I didn't know that they were friends. I've heard of her, this young lady's name ever since I've been in Atlanta. She's like her name is like. Yeah, everybody knows her. But I I never met her. She actually lives not far from where I live. So I was oh, like, what? Hey, I want to take a minute to say thank you to our sponsors of the Governor's channel here. And if you're watching this here, please visit our sponsors because they make it possible for us to do the Governor's channel. Our first sponsor is the Government Contractors Association. The Government Contractors Association or GCA is a national trade association comprised of commercial contractors, small and large companies, and government agencies, federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies, government staff, universities, nonprofits, and many other entities out there. Their vision is to create access to help small businesses to get into the government market, to open doors for commercial companies into the government marketplace, and to support government agencies in accessing more qualified contractors. Their mission is to educate, facilitate, and advocate for their members based on becoming the premier government contract association with their three pillars. Learn more about the Government Contractor Association at govassociation.org. G-O-V-A-S-S-O-C-I-A-T-I-O-N.org. Govassociation.org. Yeah, last month. That's crazy. And that's one of the things I've always appreciated about Atlanta too. I love New York and New York will always be home. I call New York home and I say that I live in Atlanta. Uh -huh. However, you can move about Atlanta and just run into some of anyone yes. at any time. And everybody is so friendly. Yes. It's so easy to just strike up a conversation and kind of just get into the thick of things. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Southern hospitality. That's what outcast sings about <laughs> that's right that's right i agree i definitely mm. agree yes yes yeah well you see, i think all these transitions that we go through from new york to georgia and then from you know going you know going from going to school for computer science to get into sales uh, you know all that prepare you for your business and yeah. it's, it set the stage for you to understand that life is a is a chapter after chapter after chapter, and it builds upon itself. And sometimes, whether you go to the right or to the left, uh, it doesn't matter. You know, once you make a decision, you'll start to build upon that, and it will lead you to ultimately, in terms of what you you mm -hmm. shared about a prophecy mm -hmm. that is meant for you to be. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so that's an incredible journey. I, I really appreciate you sharing that there. Thanks, Abe. And it's so true, too. I mean, because it really is a journey, right? And then it's all about the relationships mm -hmm. that you develop during the course of that journey. Um, going into business ownership, I'm not going to say it wasn't scary because it was scary. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It's still scary. Mm -hmm. It is definitely a faith-based walk. Absolutely. And it yes. is not for the faint of heart. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> So every, every day is a different day and a new day. <laughs> However, again, the relationship basis that we continue to make, the relationship that I developed as the Kimball representative mm -hmm. over those 23 years has been phenomenal in what I've been doing in the business over these last almost five years. Mm -hmm. So as we even talk about how, you know, maybe a contract came into a place or mm -hmm. how I started doing work with it, name a company it's based on the relationships that I developed over the years and just going to them going, Hey, I have my own business now and I need to sell you a desk or a chair and mm -hmm. what project do you have going on? Or how can I be an asset to what you already have in your existing relationships, maybe with other distributorships or with other manufacturers? I'm just trying to come in and be an asset to you, not trying to disrupt or overturn the apple cart. And it has been a great recipe for us, actually, just coming in as a compliment mm -hmm. and not as a threat. There you go. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I think we call that um, competition in the government space. In the commercial world, there's not a lot of competition going on, but in the government world, teaming and partnership is all normal. Yeah. So, yeah. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And that shift is starting to um, change just a little bit, actually, on the commercial side as well, on the corporate side, where you'll find opportunities, whether it's through a general contractor, because um, we've done quite a 
bit of business under the umbrellas of general contractors mm -hmm. as being their, their sub for whatever that case may be, right? Um, we just completed a project with Microsoft mm -hmm. where we furnished all of their whiteboards and marker boards at their Atlantic Yards development. Mm -hmm. And that was through a general contractor. They needed that, that was a part of their scope of work under the GC. And although it's furniture, it mm -hmm. kind of, it came in under their scope of work in the building aspect of the interiors of the space. And we were able to take care of that task for them. Yeah, on that note there, in terms of the work that you guys do, you know, part of my philosophy is you got to follow where the money is, right? And so especially your smaller business, you may not always have the biggest reach in terms of the bigger players and so forth. You have one advantage, 23 years of experience, but sometimes newer entrepreneurs don't have 23 years of experience in their industry. And they may have five years or two years, or they may be new in the industry. And so when you got into, into this year, uh, you start to say, okay, where is the flow of money as it gets to, as it relates to furniture? And if money goes to the general contractor and then the general contractor hires out the uh, the interior designer, sometimes the interior designer uh, bring in the furniture specialist like you in there. Tell us a little bit about that flow in terms of how your industry work from uh, how you get into the, these different projects from that perspective. So Abe, there's a couple of ways of looking at this, right? And industry wise, we actually touch all different types of industries. So mm -hmm. corp corporate, we've been talking about, but we also touch healthcare. We touch colleges and universities and we touch governmental agencies, both state and local and then mm -hmm. federal as well. Mm -hmm. When we first opened up our doors, two things happened. First of all, um, I'm a faith-based person. So you guys are gonna hear me say blessed a lot. We were blessed with a contract to work with IHG Crown Plaza. And that mm -hmm. allowed us to be able to furnish some specific areas within that particular hotel group across the country. So it did two things for my business. Um, it got us into the hospitality realm, but it also got us in several different states mm -hmm. in a really quick time frame. Mm -hmm. So we'd be able to say that we had done things nationwide. Right. Mm -hmm. The other portion of that is um, we opened our doors July 1st, right? That time frame between spring and summer is a huge time to work with colleges and universities because they are normally revamping their campuses yes. for the start of school in August. Mm -hmm. I had already started laying some seeds in the springtime, going to schools that I had worked with as a Kimball representative, mm -hmm. going, hey, getting ready to open up. What is, can we come in and compliment at your campus? Is it a classroom? Is it a lab? Is it a faculty office? Whatever it is we can do. And we picked up some contracts that way as well. So that local work falls under the state of Georgia contract. And the state of, yeah getting tongue tied. The state of Georgia contract actually has a number of different, what we call SIN numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Help to outfit whatever it is. There's furniture, there's equipment, there's landscaping, there's HVAC, basically you name it because schools need some of everything. Right. That contract houses it. So one of the things I would suggest that newer entrepreneurs do first and foremost is what is it that you're looking to market? And then once you've identified that, find out how that works under your state contract, whether it's Georgia or another state, because each state has different parameters mm -hmm. on how their state contract operates, and then start to meet the people in either procurement or facilities or a combination of both, mm -hmm. not only for colleges and universities, but for your local um, governmental agencies as well. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, yeah. that, was, that would be my first start. Then on the federal side, it's kind of similar in regards to who you need to talk to. Yeah. It's definitely the facilities person and the procurement person um, when it comes to governmental contracts as well. Again, I'm leaning back into relationships that I had. We had done work with the FAA. I kind of went and knocked on their door, mm -hmm. was able to pick up a contract with them. 
through my network of being a part of a distributorship um, under the Kimball umbrella and then meeting other Kimball dealers, I actually picked up a really nice contract with the FBI here in Georgia to help awesome. them with some furniture because it was an offshoot of um, the finishing up of a project that their main dealer out of Washington, D.C. had started, but they needed a local dealer here in Georgia to complete it for them. So we were able to kind of get our name into the FBI to do the exact same thing. And looking forward to doing that with other agencies because we were actually blessed with our 8A certification earlier this year as well. Woo! I know, right? I know you were waiting for it like in December when we talked. But... Yes, absolutely, okay. Crystal. It's so funny. I called the um, gentleman after I found that you got yours in November. Mm -hmm. I called the gentleman at... Um, G, not GSA, but who handles those types of things for the federal government, mm -hmm. the agent that had been reviewing our file, right, right. Right. Mm -hmm. developed a relationship with him because it took a year for us to get there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so you start emailing and calling them because they're emailing, calling you to ask for different tidbits of information. Right. I was like, hey, I know W comes after S and a friend of mine just got her. So uh, I'm looking to get this for right. my from a Christmas gift, right? right. It's coming, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, you definitely have to stay on them. And speaking of that, that's now a um, uh, service that I am offering, given the fact that I've been through that process twice with being wow. declined the first time and being approved the second time. It's like, um, yeah, businesses need support and coaching through this process. So I'm here to help you. So if anybody's listening that's going through the 8A process or that is interested in it and you need some assistance, give me a call. Crystal Spellman, Spellman Consulting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, it, it's, it's, it is a um, endeavor. Yeah, It can almost become a portion of your job, so to speak, where Absolutely. you have to dedicate time, whether it's each week yes. or a couple times during the course of the month or whatever that looks like. Yes. In order to get that ball over to the goal line. For Absolutely. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. So, so we're here. We're here for you. Perfect. That's I may be sending some people your way because they're like, oh, you got your 8A. How did you do it? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. hired somebody to do that. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had had me when I went through mine because it's like having somebody that has actually been through it. That's a whole different, you know, it is. Different, uh, ball game. So yeah, definitely send them, send them my way. This is good. I mean, like, you dropped some, so, so many nuggets in this short period of time. So I need for people to really pay attention to what you said. You've just, you've just given some really good uh, information about, you know, just about the contracts and how you, you GCs, you getting contracts through GCs. Who would have thought, okay, furniture, GC. So, you know, those of us in government contracting, we have to look at all options and all alternatives as to how we can, like Abe said, get to the money and, you know, for everybody watching that's something that he teaches you through his coaching um and that's i learned those things through that but yeah this is this is really good to hear so you, crystal I'll just, so i was just going to say if we kind of keep building on that mm -hmm. what the as you all know what the government is always looking for is past performance right and yeah. it's okay to build that past performance as a second tier there you go occupant or however you want to look at it, subcontractor, just to say, I do have a track record and we worked and did this type of application through this yes. particular GC um, to get you to that first tier mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a little bit of building, but it certainly can be done. I just wanted to mention that in yeah, regards yeah. to past performance. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's a great point because I built my past performance in the federal space through the subcontracting. So I'm, I'm a proponent of it all day long. Subcontract Spelman Consulting Group is open to subcontracts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, um, let, yeah. Let's dive a little deeper on the, <laughs> on the topic of uh, past performance here. So those of you who's watching this episode here, uh, in the government market, they don't know who you are. All they have is your UEID number. They have your DUNS number. They have your business name, but it's just a piece of paper. So they have no idea who you are. So the only way to create trust and credibility to a procurement contracting officer is to see what projects you worked on. So when it comes to past performance, there's different type of past performance. Uh, sometimes 
They will allow individual past performance to count on like newer emerging technology, emerging mm -hmm. industries. But for most industries, you know, whether it's facilities or office furniture or things like that, they don't, that's not an emerging industry. That's, that industry has been around forever. So, so you can't use individual past performance. You have to use corporate past performance, meaning company past performance. Mm -hmm. And if you're a brand new company, how do you build past performance? So, so Lisa, you shared a great example of how you build past performance, which is through being a subcontractor to somebody else. So now you can say, hey, I did this project, even though you're a tier one sub yeah. and there's a prime on it, you build past performance that way. That, that's usually the easiest way to build past performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But did you know that there's an easier way than that also to build past performance? Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the regulation says that, uh, you know, the, the SBA regulation says that as a small business, if you're, if you're a newer company, you don't have past performance, your subcontractor's past performance can be counted as yours. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so for example, you know, in your situation, you went and worked with a prime that was on a project, and then you built past performance internally yourself that way. So that is a great way to build past performance. But if you don't have a contract with a prime and you still want to bid on a project, the easier way is to partner with a company that have past performance, and then the regulation allows, if they're a small business or even large company, the, the regulation allows their past performance to become your past performance so you can bid on it. So practically, this is how it will work in, your, in the office furniture business uh, for you. Let's assume that you, you find a project that requires uh, you know, the government, you know, they, they have built a whole office on Kimball office furniture. Mm -hmm. and and but you you you're newer. You don't have that. You know it may be a twenty million dollar you know full furniture build out. You know for three campuses and 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 lots and lots of furniture that goes in there, and you don't have that type of past performance. Well, you can go to a Herman Miller dealer mm -hmm. and say, hey, you've got you know four, five, twenty different different uh, projects that has past performance over ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars. Why don't we partner on this here? I would do the components that's tied to Kimball and you do the components that that's not necessarily required as a Kimball product. So they can still put in the Herman Miller product. They can still put in other things. So now you're able to go after a bigger, larger project with past performance that you may not have using their past performance. So, so, so this is a very important technique for all of you who's listening, who, who wants to get into bigger projects, but you just don't have the experience. So very mm -hmm. important technique here. That's really great to know. Um, I knew that there could be a blending like that, but I didn't realize that the application could go where I could catapult or become a part of past performance from an existing entity that had already been established and had been doing work maybe with that particular agency for a number of years. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be with the agency. Ideally, it's with the agency, but it could just be any past performance, and it could be commercial past performance. It could be you know anything in the private sector. It could be government. Uh, it could okay. be healthcare related. It could be any type of projects that's similar in scope. Like you know, if they're saying if it's a if it's a five million dollar project, mm -hmm. they say three relevant past performance, and so you know as long as it's similar in scope. You can use it, and 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 the and the government will treat it. The contractor officer is required if you are a small business to treat your subcontractor's past performance as your own. So interesting. Well, you just helped me today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you share a lot of great nuggets to help the to 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 help our listeners. So so, but that's a very important technique as it relates to past performance and. And, and, and so part of you, your business is, yes, you want to go and win contracts directly. You want to win contracts as a sub to other people. Absolutely. But to win contracts for yourself, part of it is you need to develop a strong network of existing strong office furniture mm -hmm. companies out there that have the, the existing past performance. Now, are you working with any of the local companies like uh, corporate environments or... Uh, Decap Office Furniture or any of these big players that's been around for a while? 
No, we actually don't. They, um, we, it's interesting the term that you used a few moments ago about co, um, co-opetition. Co-opetition. Mm-hmm. You know, in the corporate realm, it truly is looked at as competition. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the other distributorships here in the Atlanta metro area, specifically those that are female owned, Mm -hmm. we all view each other as complete competition. Mm -hmm. Um, Crystal mentioned in my introduction that I was the first African American female to own a Kimball Select dealership here in Georgia. That is actually, I'm the first African American female to own a Select Kimball dealership in the country. country. Oh, wow. And so I, I ride that title very long and very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I've gotten both corporate certifications as a WBE through mm-hmm. WBENC and my MBE through um, GMSDC, mm-hmm. which helps to just give like that vetting process, right? In regards right. to corporate clients like your Georgia Powers and Southern companies of the world, heck, your Microsoft, your Mm -hmm. Salesforce, your whoever's Mm -hmm. of the world to know that they've been vetted, they pay their bills, they take care of their taxes, they have all of the different codes and numbers that would be needed for you to actually be able to pull off a project. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things is making sure you have your finances together. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the first things I did was get a line of credit. We were a new company, but six months in, I was like, I need a line of credit. And the first line that, um, excuse me, that was uh, approved for us was $100,000. Now that's not a whole lot of money, but it helped to build on to the next phase. So then after we got the 100,000 line credit, I went ahead and after a few months of using that and paying it back and making sure everything looked good, then you ask for the next one, right? And then we were blessed with the next line up and then the next line up. You have to have some sort of financing to start with these larger companies because these larger companies don't give deposits. Right. And, and the federal government is not going to give you a deposit, but you have to be able to buy the furniture or buy whatever the supplies that it is. I'm saying furniture because that's my industry, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you may have to go out and buy the stuff that you need to clean the floors or whatever the supplies are for your industry. You have to make sure that you have the funding in place to do that as well. But you, I mean, the hundred thousand dollars, it's not a lot of money. We know that. And, and you, but in being a, a, a black female owned business to be able to get a uh, $100,000 uh, line of credit off the top, that is awesome because you literally are the first person that I've heard that has been able to get that. Just been in recent conversations and, and seminars where uh, in the, bit, the discussion was about just that, uh, us being able to, women of color, uh, and people of color, color being able to get that access to funding. And there was a young lady who's been in business, I think like eight years, um, company in DC doing very well. And she is million dollar business having a problem with getting wow. line of credit to this day. So I, I applaud you for that because that is, that, that's big. Um, and you And what I'll say to that is truly networking, Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I really do consider myself a connector. I love connecting you are. people. Um, if I hear about something uh-huh. and I think that it's, you know, viable for, I, I will, I will put the work in right. to find out a resource for yes. you to go to, whether it's somebody looking for a new job or yes. Hey, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I was at a golf tournament mm-hmm. and there was a gentleman standing there talking about his um, business with 7A funding and Mm -hmm. how he worked with SBA and this, that, and the third. And I was like, hey, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Now his organization wasn't able to fund me, Mm -hmm. but he found somebody that could. Because my company, when I first got that hundred grand, we were, (laughs) dare I say four months old. So I didn't have a whole lot to show. Right, right. right. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I don't know that I had anything to show. I had to dip into Lisa White personal to show that Mm -hmm. in order to get that first hundred grand. Mm -hmm. 
what I'm saying is you have to kind of step out there yes. and do that. Mm -hmm. And then once you build it up, because I started using the money and didn't even need the money actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, throwing it out there. I used it efficiently and paid it back so that they could see, oh, okay, she's worth the risk. Yes. Or White House Brands is worth the risk. Because I knew I was going to have to go back and ask for yes. more mm -hmm. as I kept yeah. asking the universe for yeah. larger opportunities because the larger the opportunity is the more a lot of funding that you need <laughs> absolutely. absolutely that that's, is that's true you, you know money is not the answer to everything but money is the fuel that allows you to scale absolutely. to grow yeah. and and so absolutely you need a money strategy you, you got to have a a uh, you know opportunity you know comes and you got to have a way to fund those opportunities so that's right that's right. Because it was funny uh, when we got the contract for the Microsoft marker boards. I was like, yay, we won. And then I was like, oh my God, we won. <laughs> I was like, okay, now I have to actually go out and buy all of these boards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, what type of uh, credit do they normally extend to you? Is it net 30, 45, or, or how, how does that work? So uh, dare, dare I say, corporate actually is a wonderful realm to be a part of. And most of these large businesses pay between net 30 and net 45. And I mean, to the date, date. Uh -huh. you can set your clock by it. Okay. We invoice them on a particular day and you can almost guarantee you're going to have the money in your account between net 30 and net 45 days later. Mm -hmm. On the government side, buckle up and get ready because <laughs> you are looking at, you're looking at net 90. You're looking at net 90. Um, most of our projects can sometimes get in between 60 and 70 days, mm -hmm. but typically it's between net 90 and there I say maybe 120 days. So you, you do, you have to plan accordingly yes. when it comes to those types of endeavors. And we've worked on some over $100,000 projects for federal entities. And I knew going into it, I was like, I've got to make sure that this is exactly how we're going to lay it all out mm -hmm. because we've got several months before we're actually going to get our final payback on it. Mm -hmm. And that's both local, state, county, federal. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what agency it is. That's typically how they work. And that's fine. You just have to plan accordingly for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you found that to be true at the federal level also, because under executive orders uh, for, for pretty much every single president, uh, the, the net you know, 15 is usually what's recommended towards small businesses. Now, are you referring to you being a sub on a prime or are you being directly with the government? A sub on a prime. Okay. So I look forward to that net 15 utilizing my 8A. A. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but a sub on a prime. <laughs> I'm going to leave all the names out, but we just completed a project here for a county agency. Mm -hmm. um, I have paid all of the manufacturers. I paid my sub who does the delivery and installations for mm -hmm. us. And we completed that, I wanna say second week of February. Mm -hmm. DC has not been fully paid yet by the county, which means I have not been paid right, right. by DC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm still asking them, did, but did you ask them for the money? Right. Do I need to ask them for the money? Right, right, right. <laughs> well, it's, I'm actually, it's time. <laughs> right. Yes. So, so, so that is the difference between being a subcontractor and being a prime. Mm -hmm. So, so being a subcontractor, the the prime signs off on the invoice. Mm -hmm. They first they have to wait for you to, to invoice them. You invoice them. They gather all that. They invoice the government, the agency there. The agency, you know, have about 30 days, 45 days, depending. Local agency could be 30, 60, 90 days. Federal agencies is net 30, absolutely net 30. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, there are penalties and fees that they have to pay. So, and then through executive orders, net 15 is usually to, for all small business if it's federal contract. But the prime, they hold on to that money for their own cash flow purposes. So if they're if you're used to, or they they they've sent the 
the mm -hmm. environment to condition you to be used to 60, 90, 120 days, they may receive their money in 30 days. I agree. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but I'm they're sitting actually, on it. That's right. That's yeah, right. they're sitting on it for, for 90, 120 days. And so now federal regulation states that when the prime gets paid, they have to pay you also. They can't sit on it for 120 days. So, gotcha. So, so I don't remember the exact regulation on that, but there is a regulation that when a prime gets paid, whatever your terms of agreement with them, they have to pay you um, based upon those terms of agreement. They can't just sit on it just because they want to sit on it. So, 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 so I'm looking forward to the day where you do more, more direct contract with government agency versus being a, a, a sub. Now, being a sub is awesome because um, you don't have to worry about the proposal writing. You don't have to okay. worry about... Absolutely. building the relationships with all these different agencies. Yeah. Uh, but now that you got your 8A, you're making that transition. So this is another transition in your business career. So <laughs> another portion of the journey. Absolutely. Yes. We'll, 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 we it, yeah. will be the prime on a lot of these newer things coming up. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, one thing I do know in, in line with what we're talking about, uh, there are a lot of counties uh, that are doing, having disparity studies, uh, mm -hmm be done on their procurement processes and they are looking at exactly what you're talking about with you know as a part of that with the how the primes are paying or not paying their subs because they don't track that most of them they, they don't they don't bother with it but now because of things like this they are uh, understanding that they need to have some involvement with it even though i'm sure they would prefer not to but um, yeah, but there yeah. needs to be some sort of light shined on that, though, because um, I truly do believe that that these agencies are, quote unquote, paying their bills on time. Mm -hmm. and, and for that, that reason that, is why I want I think they want to do that to get their names cleared up. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. I agree. So so tell us a little bit about um, in terms of how you. You know, you go. You know, you started your business in 2017. So, how did you go from just you to a team of people? Because uh, a lot of new entrepreneurs, they they don't understand how to, you know, what that process looked like. So, so share a little about that in terms of going from one person to a team and then a a a, a, a real company. Yeah, it's all about scaling up, right? And then looking at what is coming into your funnel and planning that appropriately. And also feeling comfortable with delegating and letting go. Because even after I brought on our first, you know, business development person, that person was very clear on what they needed to do and how to work the process. Mm -hmm. And I had to feel comfortable with letting them work the process right. and absolutely developing their own leads, their relationships with clients, with making sure that the order did get placed, just going throughout the entire process. So I went from me and then a business partner business partner being a part of our portfolio to me and a business development person and an admin person in about a year and a half, I want to say within the business, I may have stepped into having W2s a little quicker than most, mm -hmm. but I was also looking at the dealership model and what was successful with other dealers mm -hmm. and what I was used to in working for a dealership yeah. and knowing that that was a recipe for success. Mm -hmm. You have got to let go certain aspects of that day-to-day -day stuff that happens in your business. And as I'm continuing to hear and talk about with other business owners, and Crystal and Abe, I know y'all both know this, it truly is the difference between working in your business and on your business. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about working on the business, yes. not being so much in the weeds of in my business. So today we're a happy team of four um, and continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. I make no bones about it. I'm actually looking for another person to come on board, potentially mid to late this year, if not mm -hmm. early 2023. Because that's the only way to continue scaling up. Yes. Yeah, what exactly are you looking for? Because, yeah, some past guests have had some open opportunities as well. And so we're like. So I, I truly do need another person to execute the design and mm -hmm. space planning and um, doing specifications for us. Mm -hmm. People don't begin to even understand how intricate commercial furniture, dare I say furniture, is 
Mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. um, on the residential side, yes, you can walk in the rooms to go and Ashley and Ikea mm -hmm. and all these places and you see something really pretty that you want. And typically it's like, okay, do you want it in blue, yellow, or orange? Mm -hmm. In commercial furnishings, it becomes a bit more robust than that. A single chair can have about four different SKU numbers to make up that chair. Oh, and if yeah. we don't order that chair in the blue fabric with the black base, with the trim of whatever on it that the client asks for, we're keeping that chair. And dare I say, hopefully it's just one chair and not 30 wow. chairs <laughs> that arrived in the wrong finish or in the wrong fabric. So it takes a detailed eye and it also takes um, concentration on mm -hmm. getting those SKU numbers together to produce that order. And when you're looking at a 50,000 square foot project to fill that space with furniture and you have all those different SKU numbers, it takes a full team to be able to put that together. Yeah, well, you know, I love the industry and um, one of my early business was the office furniture company. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember, I'll, I'll share this quick story here. I remember I was working for a office furniture company and one day I said, you know what, if I can do that for them, I can do it for myself. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, I left, I, I had $300 to my name and people say, well, how are you going to build an office furniture business with $300? <laughs> and it goes back to what you shared earlier, that business is not about furniture. It's really about people, right? It's really yes. about relationship. Mm -hmm. We are in the business of selling ourselves and you've done sales for all, you know, most of your adult career. We, Everybody is in the business of, of, of sales. That's right. If you are, uh, if you have a friend, you have to sell yourself to your friend mm -hmm. so that they can like you and, and trust mm -hmm. you. If, mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're married, you have to convince your spouse to choose you out of, out of uh, you know, uh, in the U.S. is about th 330 million people here. You have to convince 330 million people, uh, one of them out of 330 million people to choose you. And so, so that's I haven't done a good job with that. So, so, so Crystal, you need to work on you need to work on sales a little bit more. You're being very selective, Crystal, and you should be. How about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> but hey, yeah. you're absolutely right, though. Um, it's pretty much how we've raised our children. That you are, they call it branding now. Mm -hmm. um, back when. I was a little girl. They definitely didn't call it branding, but my mom instilled in us of you want to be the represent you. First of all, you represent your family the moment right. you walk out of this door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the edict was you better be representing us correctly. That's right. number one. Right. But then you're also representing yourself. And we are constantly selling ourselves. You're absolutely right. Whether it's in a job interview, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's, you know, wherever. Uh, yes. As we walk around, when we go into the bank, when you're looking for that loan, when you're asking for that line of credit, when you're at that networking event and there's, dare I say, even today, you guys, because I realize we're within, you know, this virus and the virus is not going away. But mm -hmm. I went to an amazing networking event about three weeks ago and there was 200 plus people there. Mm -hmm. And we were maneuvering around and we were being, you know, respectful of each other. You know, did you feel comfortable with me coming close mm -hmm. or what have you? But you're still representing yourself and we were all selling each other to each other. Each other. Right. It, it right. was almost about a lot of us. We knew each other, but we hadn't seen each other in over 18 months in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're almost re-engaging with people that you do know. And then the folks that you don't know, you're selling yourself to them. So it really is that branding of yourself. Dare I even add the proponent of what I didn't have in my early 20s, but we do now is social media. So you're also branding and selling yourself in your social media aspects as well. And you have to look at what's that best avenue for you that way also. Is your audience on Facebook? Is your audience on Instagram? Is your audience on Twitter? Is your audience in LinkedIn? And make those decisions so that you can continue developing relationships that way as well. I've developed quite a few relationships on LinkedIn mm -hmm. to start the conversation mm -hmm. and then continue moving that needle forward to where it actually transpired into 
a closed sale mm -hmm. and then building on that as well. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are in a, a people business and, you know, we sometimes it's the reputation, sometimes creating a brand is creating trust. Uh, and so my first business was office furniture. And I knew that if I can find someone with a problem, I can find somebody else that have a solution. Solution. Because with $300, I can't buy a chair. I mean, <laughs> you know, like a Herman Miller Air, Aaron chair. I, I have this Herman Miller Aaron chair I'm sitting on. Brand new is like $1,300, $1,400. That's right. Well, you know, and when I started my business, I didn't have, you know, $1,400 to buy a chair. So, but I knew that if I understood people, I can find people that had a problem. I can find people that had a solution and I can connect the two and I make money in the process. And really that's what you do, right? When you're, when you're selling furniture, mm -hmm. you're not the manufacturer. No, nope. You're not the, you, you don't even install the furniture yourself. You, when's the last time you picked up a, uh, 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 a, a drill and a screw to put, to put some furniture together, right? <laughs> absolutely, so, we I, don't. We absolutely yeah, so as, don't. As, you're really in the people business of mm -hmm. just bringing different resource people together and then you make money. And, and when you do that, that's how you make money. And so, so you're a great example of that there. So, so we're t towards the end of our show here, but share some, some things that you've learned along the way and give some tips to our audience here in terms of just whether... Uh, let's start off with things that you have made mistakes, the hard knocks, and let's start with that and then share some other positive things uh, as a secondary uh, topic here. Well, let's see, hard knocks, because um, this is a very consultative application. Um, I think maybe some of our onset challenges is wearing a lot of hats mm -hmm. as a new entrepreneur and in the beginning phases of White Howard Brands, I did wear a lot of hats. So you get torn in a lot of different directions. Meeting with the SBA people, it helped me to identify those things that I enjoyed doing and then those things that I did not enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the wherewithal where to draw the line and perhaps maybe it doesn't become a w2 person within your organization but it could become a consultant within your organization where you're paying them and they're a 1099 and that's okay mm -hmm. so we have a bookkeeper that handles all of that kind of good stuff because i wasn't really good about making sure that the bills got paid because i'm out trying to get more business right, right? and it's a little difficult to do that and everything else mm -hmm. so they made some things really abundantly clear um, to me in regards to how to kind of go about maneuvering things and that would be one of my suggestions or one of my nuggets. Everyone does not have to be a W-2 under your umbrella. Mm -hmm. It is okay to get the right consultant to help you move your business forward and thrive and enhance for the different application that it becomes. Because there's somebody out there that can do everything. We right. have an HR consultant under our umbrella. Because I think I heard, um, if you, I'll remind everybody, we're a team of four. Mm -hmm. And the four people on our team includes me. So from HR to bookkeeping, to the CPA, to the people that handle our deliveries and our installations, all of that are subcontractors for White Howard Brands that are mm -hmm. 1099s to us. Do mm -hmm. we pay them for their services? Of course we do. Right. However, it's just another line item that you have to look at. Mm -hmm. That would be one of my bigger aha moments a year or so into my business where I was like, this is not working <laughs> and I need some help in getting this right. done and how can I go about doing that? So they helped, they helped me to look at that in regards to business planning. Um, on the flip side, the other great things is just continuing to develop those relationships. Mm -hmm. I literally did go back in my database um, coming from being an employee of Kimball to an owner of the dealer distributorship to where can I go to find business with these existing relationships? Whether it's, like I say, a school, um, whether it's a privately held school or a state agency school, they both are working within the same genre and where they actually need things to enhance their campuses. Whether it's a corporate client or a government client, whether it's a healthcare client, 
or somebody that's in finance or that's a CPA or that's a law firm. I just looked at all those different applications to figure out what, who can I pick the phone up and mm -hmm. literally say, hey, it's Lisa mm -hmm. on the other end. And I'm really just trying to find a way for us to do business together. And it is just kind of continue to move forward from there. I, I feel like sometimes that sounds a little flippant because um, people will go, well, she didn't really tell me, you know, that, but it really is that. Mm -hmm. It is all about the relationship and it selling is. yourself. It truly is. And then looking at um, your particular industry and what organizations are out there for you to join. How can you further your business by um, potentially networking with others within your industry yes. that do mm -hmm. similar things as you so that you can kind of work in tandem with them because again it goes back to the teaming we don't all have to have the entire pie i will gladly take one sixteenth of the there pie. you go that's one thirty second of the pie <laughs> because something out of that pie is better than nothing out of that pie. there you go and if you keep building on that, that 132 is going to multiply and multiply and multiply. Absolutely. And it's different pies. Absolutely. So I'm getting 132nd out of the pie of government. Okay. I'm getting 132nd right. out of the pie of healthcare. I'm getting 132nd out of the pie of industrial. 132nd out of the pie of corporate. You blend all that together because you wanted to keep your portfolio diversified. Yeah. Because yeah. you just never know where the tide is going to happen. Absolutely. Um, during the pandemic of 2020, we were blessed to have what, you know, society or politically or whatever you want to call it, deem two essential projects. Because mm -hmm. we were working out at the airport because furniture goes everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. And so that just kept us going throughout a good portion of 2020 was those two projects. Yes, we were the sub under two mm -hmm. general contractors. And I will still take that all day long all every day. day. Um, them being on the side, me being on somewhat of the sidelines, but me doing all of the furniture under those two general contractors, and they were considered essential projects. So we kept moving in that vein. Between that and healthcare is what kept us going in 2020, and dare I say 2021, and even coming into 22. Now, 22 has brought about some newer corporate applications mm -hmm. and some new government applications, specifically with us getting our 8A, but you have to continue to be flexible within your business as well, and definitely stay diversified. Awesome. That's awesome. Now, what's the biggest project in terms of revenue that you've uh, uh, won, or as a sub, or as a prime? Um, our biggest project to date is actually be kind of competing um, between the Microsoft project and a project that we're currently in right now with Georgia Power. Mm -hmm. Both of those were very high six figure projects for mm -hmm. us and mm -hmm. they've been really exciting to be a part of awesome. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but our bread and butter um, when it comes to, and Abe, you noticed you actually just shared it. Um, commercial furnishings is not inexpensive, right? So that Aaron chair that you're talking about, you're mm -hmm. right. It's about 1300 bucks. So just imagine selling, you know, 80 of those, uh -huh. 100 of those, 200 of those. Um, and we do do that. So um, smaller projects for us kind of run within the $150,000 range. And then up well, from that, that, that's about three wheels or four chair. <laughs> <laughs> Not even four, three. <laughs> can can be can be. Um, sweet spots for us are fifty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand, mm -hmm. and then upwards from that, just depending on what the application is. Um, the three of us have actually been sitting now for a, almost an hour, maybe a little over an hour, something that we continue to teach, if you haven't already heard, is sitting is just like smoking. Yeah. So when you sit stationary, your body is just kind of almost blending into nothingness, and it's very important to move roughly about five to seven minutes out of every hour. Mm -hmm. So what I would encourage all of the listeners to do, and even the three of us, even if it's right now, is to just stand <laughs> and get yes, a stretch. Stand. 
<laughs> you be proud of me, Lisa. I have a a, 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 a desk that lifts, so I, I do. Stay. I think I even got some some consultation with you before you even That's get right. It is <laughs> all it's all about movement these days. So feel free to lift that desk up because I have one also. Isn't that great? Yes. So let me stand up for the last portion of this. How about that? Yes. Yes. That's Change awesome. the game up a little bit. Absolutely. But yeah. Absolutely. Because sitting is truly just like smoking. So you want to try and stay moving. And then Abe mentioned his wonderful chair again. A really great desk chair allows you to be able to do that, to articulate back and forth, to move your arms up and down, to be able to twist left and right in your chair. You want your chair to actually be a movement within yourself also when you're working at your desk. So those are some of the things that we like to teach our clients in regards to the working environments that they're in, whether it's their home office or mm -hmm. out in the workspace, just so that they're keeping their bodies healthy. What we have been engaging with a lot of our clients is the well-being of the employee. I think mm -hmm. 2020 taught us so many different things, right? Yes. Um, and we've or they re-enhanced a lot of things. They didn't, it didn't teach us anything. We already knew it, but it re-enhanced it. And the mm -hmm. well-being of your employees, i.e. yourself, is key and foremost in everything that we do. Everything. And that becomes a part of you selling yourself and mm -hmm. then developing those relationships. But you have to be healthy here for yourself right. as well. Yeah. That's right. Well, hey, that's a great tip. Um, what you need to do, Lisa, is you need to event a chair that if you sit, it, you can set a timer. If you sit on it, it makes contact, right? And so every 30 minutes or if you set it for an hour, it, it buzzes you so that you, it reminds you to get up and move about and then you sit back down and- uh, I, I, think, I think the Fitbits and things like that of the world have actually already taken yeah. that over. I don't know that we need more chairs, yeah. to, <laughs> chairs to tell us. <laughs> But that's well, an interesting caveat, though. Chair that lifts you up like in the cartoons. You sitting too long, it just kind of kicks you out. Of it, the it, it, it catapults you out. Right, that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> One of the things is funny, though, that you do mention that. So in some of this different seating that we offer, when you decide that you do want to stand up and kind of move about that way, if you've elevated your desk up and you're like, hey, I'm really comfortable in this position, we have chairs that will come up to that height as well when you go to sit back down. So you don't necessarily have to bring your desk mm -hmm. back down to what they call seated height. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. do you guys, you provide like the, uh, I know some of the work desks, which I looked at this myself, the uh, treadmills and the bikes. Um, is that something that you provide? There are products out there that, yes, you can actually exercise while you work if you want to, read manuscripts, proposals, jot things down, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Furniture has exploded. It yeah. just does so many different things. And like I said, there goes everywhere. There is an application for everything mm -hmm. now. And there's a product to help with that application. One of the um, projects that we've worked on, the client called their huddle rooms, wellness rooms. And it really was just like a little quiet space for the employees to be able to go. Mm -hmm. It was not intended for them to work when they go into their mm -hmm. quiet space. It was meant for you to just kind of go and, you know, woosa and just feel at ease, whether it's for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or you spend an hour in there. Mm -hmm. So that when you come back out, you're refreshed and you're wanting to be more engaged and then you can be more productive. There's so many different studies that have been done and research around this too as well. It's just keeping the workspace healthy. There mm -hmm. I say even more so now because of where we are with this virus. Yeah, I remember well, the huddle rooms and working at uh, UPS when we moved to a more technical side. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, they called it the Enoplex at the time. And the furniture was like, unlike any other UPS location. So we had games. I mean, it was just, yeah, I could see that you, you probably provided some of that furniture, but we did have those huddle rooms where it was just that you just go in and sit down, um, you know, 
no work, no work. No, that's right. I enjoyed that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it made you a more productive person. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. yes. Krista, you were there for eight hours a day. How are you? How are you more pr productive in there? What? Wait, now. Don't stop. <laughs> You're, you're in the choir room for eight hours a day. Look at A trying to call you. See, you see how it works? <laughs> That's how I hear me. It's all good. Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, it's it's been fun, uh, Lisa. We're we're, uh, we're at the uh, hour here, so 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 uh, share with this here. If somebody is a GC or an interior designer or looking uh, to partner with you in any capacity, or even somebody who's out of furniture, they may be in a in a parallel market but they're not 8A certified and they want to team with you and they want to say, hey, Lisa, let's use your 8A to go after the project. And I'll do, I'll be a sub to you, you be the prime. How do they get in contact with you? And uh, what's your website? And, and give us your phone number so they can reach out to you. Absolutely. So our website is the full name of the company, whitehowardbrands.com. Mm -hmm. They can reach me at 678 517-4101 or at lisa at whb-llc.com. And I welcome any architect, interior designer, space planner, general contractor, engineer, almost you name it, that is looking to team or partner with us, both under the federal space or the local county governmental space or within a corporate space, to feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to entertain and talk through what that would look like. We've been doing that now since we opened our doors almost five years ago and look forward to doing it more so. All right, well, hey, we're, it's been a joy and a pleasure having you here with us, Lisa and Crystal. I love it when we do governance together, talking right. about these great entrepreneurs out there who are yes. who's, who's who in their own way have made you know baby steps and now they're growing small, thriving businesses. And for all, all of you who's listening to us, uh, keep going on your entrepreneurial journey. You know, you your, your your journey in terms of being a government contractor, your journey as an entrepreneur uh, doesn't matter where you are now. The the opportunities are enormous. Contracting dollars are out there. It's not a matter of if you will win a contract, but when you win a contract, because mm -hmm. contracting officers, they need you. They need small yes. businesses to work in the government space. So continue. Thank you for listening to us. Any closing comments, Crystal and Lisa, before we wrap up here? Well, I'll just say, as Lisa has stated uh, over and over again, continue to build those relationships because it's what is needed in order for us to be successful as small businesses and entrepreneurs. And I think my closing comment would be, Abe, you actually just hit it. Um, as I was sharing about diversifying and looking at those things that you do well and potentially you need to offset to somebody else, the federal mm -hmm. government does the exact same thing. It's things that they do really well. And then it's things that they need to offshoot to another company, i.e. all of us mm -hmm. and everybody that is listening. So you're right. It's not how do I get that government contract? It's when I get that government contract because they're looking for some of everything. They're yeah. looking on how to get better branding. They're looking mm -hmm. on how to do some bookkeeping and marketing and furniture and janitorial services mm -hmm. and landscaping. So it's there. We just have to go out to those websites, find that SIN number that you're falling under and looking for those RFPs that they're actually soliciting for those different types of services. All right, well, hey, all of you listening to us until the next episode, Lisa, Crystal.